David Hume by John Watts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. David Hume by John Watts. Lord Brougham has rendered service not only to letters, but also to free thought by his admirable lives, incomparably the best we have of Voltaire, Rousseau, Hume, Gibbon, etc. From Lord Brougham we learn, whose life in this sketch we follow, that David Hume, related to the Earl of Hume's family, was born in Edinburgh in April 1711. Refusing to be made a lawyer, he was sent in 1734 to a mercantile house in Bristol. The desk, not suiting the embryo historian's genius, we find him in 1737 at La Fleche in Anjou, writing his stillborn Treatise on Human Nature, which in 1742, in separate essays, attracted some notice. Keeper and companion to the Marquis of Annandale in 1745, Private secretary to General St. Clair in 1747, he visited on embassy the courts of Vienna and Turin. While at Turin he completed his inquiry concerning the human understanding, and the treatise on human nature in a new form. Returned to Scotland, he published his political discourses in 1752, and the same year his inquiry concerning the principles of morals. The essays, moral and metaphysical, are the form in which we now read these speculations. In 1752 Hume became librarian to the Faculty of Advocates. In 1754 he published the first volume of his History of England. In 1755 appeared his Natural History of Religion. In 1763 he accompanied the British ambassador to Paris. In 1765 he became chargé d'affaires. In 1766 he was appointed under Secretary of State under Marshal Conway. In 1775 he was seized with a mortal disease which he bore without any abatement of his cheerfulness. And on the 25th of August, Le Bon David, as he was styled in Paris, died, to use his own words, having no enemies except all the Whigs, all the Tories, and all the Christians which was something to his honor and a testimony to the usefulness of his life. David Hume was the first writer who gave historical distinction to Great Britain. Lord John Russell remarked in a speech at Bristol in October 1854, We have no other history of England than Hume's. When a young man of eighteen asks for a history of England, there is no resource but to give him Hume. Hume was the author of the modern doctrines of politics and political economy which now rule the world of science. He was the sagacious unfolder of truth, the accurate and bold discoverer of popular error. More than a skeptic, he was an atheist. Such is Lord Brougham's judgment of him. Hume carried free thought into high places. In originality of thought, grace of style and logical ability, he distanced all rival writers on religion in his time, and what is of no small importance, his life was as blameless as his intellect was unapproachable. Our first extract from his writings is a felicitous statement of the pro and con on the questions of polygamous and single marriages. A man, in conjoining himself to a woman, is bound to her according to the terms of his engagement. In begetting children he is bound by all the ties of nature and humanity to provide for their subsistence and education. When he has performed these two parts of duty, no one can reproach him with injustice or injury. And as the terms of his engagement, as well as the methods of subsisting his offspring, may be various, it is mere superstition to imagine that marriage can be entirely uniform, and will admit only of one mode or form. Did not human laws restrain the natural liberty of men, every particular marriage would be as different as contracts or bargains of any other kind or species. 
As circumstances vary and the laws propose different advantages, we find that in different times and places they impose different conditions on this important contract. In Tonquin it is unusual for the sailors, when the ship comes into the harbor, to marry for the season, and notwithstanding this precarious arrangement they are assured, it is said, of the strictest fidelity to their bed, as well as in the whole management of their affairs from those temporary spouses. I cannot at present recollect my authorities, but I have somewhere read that the Republic of Athens, having lost many of its citizens by war and pestilence, allowed every man to marry two wives in order the sooner to repair the waste which had been made by these calamities. The poet Euripides happens to be coupled to two noisy vixens, who so plagued him with their jealousies and quarrels that he became ever after a professed woman-hater and is the only theatrical writer, perhaps the only poet, that ever entertained an aversion to the sex. The advocates for polygamy may recommend it as the only effectual remedy for the disorders of love, and the only expedient for freeing men from that slavery to the females which the natural violence of our passions has imposed upon us. By this means alone we can regain our right of sovereignty, and, sating our appetite, re-establish the authority of reason in our minds, and, of consequence, our own authority in our families. Man, like a weak sovereign, being unable to support himself against the wiles and intrigues of his subjects, must play one faction against the other, and become absolute by the mutual jealousy of the females. To divide and to govern is a universal maxim, and by neglecting it the Europeans undergo a more grievous and a more ignominious slavery than the Turks or Persians, who are subjected indeed to a sovereign that lies at a distance from them, but in their domestic affairs rules with an uncontrollable sway. On the other hand, it may be urged with better reason that this sovereignty of the male is a real usurpation and destroys that nearness of rank, not to say equality, which nature has established between the sexes. We are by nature their lovers, their friends, their patrons. Would we willingly exchange such endearing appellations for the barbarous title of master and tyrant? In what capacity shall we gain by this inhuman proceeding? As lovers or as husbands? The lover is totally annihilated, and courtship, the most agreeable scene in life, can no longer have place where women have not the free disposal of themselves, but are bought and sold like the meanest animal. The husband is as little a gainer, having found the admirable secret of extinguishing every part of love except its jealousy. No rose without its thorn, but he must be a foolish wretch indeed that throws away the rose and preserves only the thorn. But the Asiatic manners are as destructive to friendship as to love. Jealousy excludes men from all intimacies and familiarities with each other. No one dares bring his friend to his house or table lest he bring a lover to his numerous wives. Hence, all over the East, each family is as much separate from another as if they were so many distinct kingdoms. No wonder, then, that Solomon, living like an Eastern prince with his seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, without one friend, could write so pathetically concerning the vanity of the world. Had he tried the secret of one wife or mistress, a few friends, and a great many companions, he might have found life somewhat more agreeable. Destroy love and friendship. What remains in the world worth accepting? Next we quote his famous statement of the principle of utility in morals. There has been a controversy started of late much better worth examination concerning the general foundation of morals, whether they be derived from reason or from sentiment whether we attain the knowledge of them by a chain of argument and induction, or by an immediate feeling and finer internal sense, whether, like all sound judgment of truth and falsehood, they should be the name to every rational intelligent being, or whether, like the perception of beauty and deformity, they be founded entirely on the particular fabric and constitution of the human species. 
The ancient philosophers, though they often affirm that virtue is nothing but conformity to reason, yet in general seem to consider morals as deriving their existence from taste and sentiment. On the other hand, our modern inquirers, though they also talk much of the beauty of virtue and deformity of vice, yet have commonly endeavored to account for these distinctions by metaphysical reasonings, and by deductions from the most abstract principles of the understanding. Such confusion reigned in these subjects that an opposition of the greatest consequence could prevail between one system and another, and even in the parts of almost each individual system, and yet nobody, till very lately, was ever sensible of it. The elegant Lord Shaftesbury, who first gave occasion to remark this distinction, and who in general adhered to the principles of the ancients, is not himself entirely free from the same confusion. In all determinations of morality the circumstance of public utility is ever principally in view, and wherever disputes arise, either in philosophy or common life, concerning the bounds of duty, the question cannot by any means be decided with greater certainty than by ascertaining on any side the true interests of mankind. If any false opinion, embraced from appearances, has been found to prevail as soon as farther experience and sounder reasoning have given us juster notions of human affairs, we retract our first sentiment, and adjust anew the boundaries of moral good and evil. Giving alms to common beggars is naturally praised, because it seems to carry relief to the distressed and indignant. But when we observe the encouragement thence arising to idleness and debauchery, we regard that species of charity rather as a weakness than a virtue. Tyrannicide, or the assassination of usurpers and oppressive princes, was highly extolled in ancient times, because it both freed mankind from many of these monsters, and seemed to keep the others in awe whom the sword or poniard could not reach. But history and experience having since convinced us that this practice increases the jealousy and cruelty of princes, a Timoleon and a Brutus, though treated with indulgence on account of the prejudices of their times, are now considered as very improper models for imitation. Liberality in princes is regarded as a mark of beneficence. But when it occurs that the homely bread of the honest and industrious is often thereby converted into delicious cakes for the idle and the prodigal, we soon retract our heedless praises. The regrets of a prince for having lost a day were noble and generous, but had he intended to have spent it in acts of generosity to his greedy courtiers, it was better lost than misemployed after that manner that justice is useful to society, and consequently that part of its merit at least must arise from that consideration, it would be superfluous undertaking to prove. That public utility is the sole origin of justice, that reflections on the beneficial consequences of this virtue are the sole foundation of its merit. This proposition, being more curious and important, will better deserve our examination and inquiry. Let us suppose that nature has bestowed on the human race such profuse abundance of all external conveniences, that without any uncertainty in the event, without any care or industry on our part, every individual finds himself fully provided with whatever his most voracious appetite can want, or luxurious imagination wish or desire. His natural beauty, we shall suppose, surpasses all acquired ornaments. The perpetual clemency of the seasons renders useless all clothes or covering. The raw herbage affords him the most delicious fare, the clear fountain the richest beverage. No laborious occupation required, no tillage, no navigation. Music, poetry, and contemplation form his sole business. Conversation, mirth, and friendship his sole amusement. It seems evident that in such a happy state every other social virtue would flourish and receive tenfold increase, but the cautious, jealous virtue of justice would never once have been dreamed of. For what purpose making a partition of goods, where every one has already more than enough? Why give rise to property where there cannot possibly be an injury? Why call this object mine? 
when upon seizing of it by another, I need but stretch out my hand to possess myself of what is equally valuable. Justice in that case, being totally useless, would be an idle ceremonial, and could never possibly have place in the catalogue of virtues. We see, even in the present necessitous condition of mankind, that wherever any benefit is bestowed by nature in an unlimited abundance, we leave it always in common among the whole human race, and make no subdivisions of right and property. Water and air, though the most necessary of all objects, are not challenged as the property of individuals, nor can any man commit injustice by the most lavish use and enjoyment of these blessings. In fertile, extensive countries, with few inhabitants, land is regarded on the same footing, and no topic is so much insisted on by those who defend the liberty of the seas as the unexhausted use of them in navigation. Were the advantages procured by navigation as inexhaustible, these reasoners had never had any adversaries to refute, nor had any claims ever been advanced of a separate exclusive dominion over the ocean. Suppose a society to fall into such want of all common necessaries, that the utmost frugality and industry cannot preserve the greater number from perishing, and the whole from extreme misery. It will readily, I believe, be admitted that the strict laws of justice are suspended in such a pressing emergence, and given place to the stronger motives of necessity and self-preservation. Is it any crime after a shipwreck to seize whatever means or instrument of safety one can lay hold of without regard to former limitations of property? Or, if a city besieged were perishing with hunger, can we imagine that men will see any means of preservation before them and lose their lives from a scrupulous regard to what, in other situations, would be the rules of equity and justice? The use and tendency of that virtue is to procure happiness and security by preserving order in society. But where the society is ready to perish from extreme necessity, no greater evil can be dreaded from violence and injustice, and every man may now provide for himself by all the means which prudence can dictate or humanity permit. The public, even in less urgent necessities, opens granaries without the consent of proprietors, as justly supposing that the authority of magistracy may, consistent with equity, extend so far. But were any number of men to assemble without the tie of laws or civil jurisdiction, would an equal partition of bread and of famine, though affected by power and even violence, be regarded as criminal or injurious? Suppose, likewise, that it should be a virtuous man's fate to fall into the society of ruffians, remote from the protection of laws and government. What conduct must he embrace in that melancholy situation? He sees such a desperate rapaciousness prevail, such a disregard to equity, such contempt of order, such stupid blindness to future consequences, as must immediately have the most tragical conclusion, and must terminate in destruction to the greater number, and in total dissolution of society to the rest. He, meanwhile, can have no other expedient than to arm himself to whomever the sword he seizes or the buckler may belong to make provision of all means of defense and security, and his particular regard to justice being no longer of use to his own safety or that of others, he must consult the dictates of self-preservation alone, without concern for those who no longer merit his care and attention. But perhaps the difficulty of accounting for these effects of usefulness, or its contrary, has kept philosophers from admitting them into their systems of ethics, and has induced them to employ any other principle in explaining the origin of moral good and evil. But it is no just reason for rejecting any principle, confirmed by experience, that we cannot give a satisfactory account of its origin, nor are able to resolve it into other more general principles. And if we would employ a little thought on the present subject, we need be at no loss to account for the influence of utility, and deduce it from principles the most known and avowed in human nature. Usefulness is agreeable, and engages our approbation. This is a matter of fact, confirmed by daily observation. But useful for what? 
for somebody's interest, surely. Whose interest, then? Not our own only, for our approbation frequently extends farther. It must, therefore, be the interest of those who are served by the character or action approved of, and these, we may conclude, however remote, are not totally indifferent to us. By opening up this principle, we shall discover one great source of moral distinctions. The origin and mischiefs of theistic influences is the subject of the following passage. It must necessarily, indeed, be allowed that in order to carry men's attention beyond the present course of things, or lead them into any inference concerning invisible intelligent power, they must be actuated by some passion which prompts their thought and reflection, some motive which urges their first inquiry. But what passion shall we here have recourse to for explaining an effect of such mighty consequence? Not speculative curiosity, surely, or the pure love of truth. That motive is too refined for such gross apprehensions, and would lead men into inquiries concerning the frame of nature, a subject too large and comprehensive for their narrow capacities. No passions, therefore, can be supposed to work upon such barbarians. But the ordinary affections of human life, the anxious concern for happiness, the dread of future misery, the terror of death, the thirst of revenge, the appetite for food and other necessaries, agitated by hopes and fears of this nature, especially the latter, men scrutinize with a trembling curiosity the course of future causes, and examine the various and contrary events of human life and in this disordered scene, with eyes still more disordered and astonished, they see the first obscure traces of divinity. We hang in perpetual suspense between life and death, health and sickness, plenty and want, which are distributed amongst the human species by secret and unknown causes, whose operation is oft unexpected and always unaccountable. These unknown causes, then, become the constant object of hope and fear, and while the passions are kept in perpetual alarm by an anxious expectation of the events, the imagination is equally employed in forming ideas of those powers on which we have so entire a dependence. Could men anatomize nature according to the most probable, at least the most intelligible philosophy, they would find that these causes are nothing but the particular fabric and structure of the minute parts of their own bodies, and of external objects, and that by a regular and constant machinery all the events are produced, about which they are so much concerned. There is a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves, and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted, and of which they are intimately conscious. We find human faces in the moon, armies in the clouds, and by a natural propensity, if not corrected by experience and reflection, ascribe malice or good will to everything that hurts or pleases us. Hence the frequency and beauty of the prosopopoeia in poetry, where trees, mountains, and streams are personified, and the intimate parts of nature acquire sentiment and passion. And though these poetical figures and expressions gain not on the belief, they may serve at least to prove a certain tendency in the imagination, without which they could neither be beautiful nor natural. Nor is a river-god or homodryad always taken for a mere poetical or imaginary personage, but may sometimes enter into the real creed of the ignorant vulgar, while each grove or field is represented as possessed of a particular genius or invisible power which inhabits and protects it. Nay, philosophers cannot entirely exempt themselves flora this natural frailty, but have oft ascribed to inanimate matter the horror of a vacuum, sympathies, antipathies, and other affections of human nature. The absurdity is not less, while we cast our eyes upwards, and transferring, as is too usual, human passions and infirmities to the deity, represent him as jealous and revengeful, capricious and partial, and, in short, 
a wicked and foolish man in every respect but his superior power and authority. No wonder, then, that mankind, being placed in such an absolute ignorance of causes, and being at the same time so anxious concerning their future fortune, should immediately acknowledge a dependence on invisible powers, possessed of sentiment and intelligence. The unknown causes, which continually employ their thought, appearing always in the same aspect, are all apprehended to be of the same kind or species. Nor is it long before we ascribe to them thought and reason and passion, and sometimes even the limbs and fingers of men, in order to bring them nearer to a resemblance with ourselves. It is remarkable that the principles of religion have a kind of flux and reflux in the human mind, and that men have a natural tendency to rise from idolatry to theism, and to sink again from theism into idolatry. The vulgar, that is, indeed, all mankind, a few excepted, being ignorant and uninstructed, never elevate their contemplation to the heavens or penetrate by their disquisitions into the secret structure of vegetable or animal bodies, so far as to discover a supreme mind or original providence, which bestowed order on every part of nature. They consider these admirable works in a more confined and selfish view, and finding their own happiness and misery, too, depend on the secret influence and unforeseen concurrence of external objects, they regard with perpetual attention the unknown causes which govern all these natural events, and distribute pleasure and pain, good and ill, by their powerful but silent operation. The unknown causes are still appealed to on every emergency, and in this general appearance or confused image are the perpetual objects of human hopes and fears, wishes and apprehensions. By degrees the active imagination of men, uneasy in this abstract conception of objects about which it is incessantly employed, begins to render them more particular, and to clothe them in shapes more suitable to its natural comprehension. It represents them to be sensible, intelligent beings like mankind, actuated by love and hatred and flexible by gifts and entreaties, by prayers and sacrifices. Hence the origin of religion, and hence the origin of idolatry or polytheism. More has been written by theologians in endeavors to refute the following passage than has ever been called forth by the wit of man before by the same number of words. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. Why is it more probable that all men must die, that lead cannot of itself remain suspended in the air, that fire consumes wood and is extinguished by water? unless it be that these events are found agreeable to the laws of nature, and there is required a violation of these laws, or, in other words, a miracle, to prevent them. Nothing is esteemed a miracle, if it ever happen in the common course of nature. It is no miracle that a man seemingly in good health should die on a sudden, because such a kind of death, though more unusual than any other, has yet been frequently observed to happen. But it is a miracle that a dead man should come to life, because that has never been observed in any age or country. There must, therefore, be a uniform experience against every miraculous event. Otherwise the event would not merit that appellation. And as a uniform experience amounts to a proof, there is here a direct and full proof from the nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle. Nor can such a proof be destroyed, or the miracle rendered credible, but by an opposite proof, which is superior. The plain consequence is, and it is a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle, unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case there is a mutual destruction of arguments, and the superior only gives us an assurance suitable to that degree of force which remains after destructing the inferior. 
When any one tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event which he relates, then and not till then can he pretend to command my belief or opinion. There is not to be found in all history any miracle attested by a sufficient number of men of such unquestioned good sense, education, and learning as to secure us against all delusion in themselves, of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others, of such credit and reputation in the eyes of mankind as to have a great deal to lose in case of their being detected in any falsehood and at the same time attesting facts performed in such a public manner and in so celebrated a part of the world as to render the detection unavoidable all which circumstances are requisite to give us a full assurance of the testimony of men one of the best attested miracles in all profane history is that which tacitus reports of vespasian who cured a blind man in alexandria by means of his spittle and a lame man by the mere touch of his foot, in obedience to a vision of the good Seraphis who had enjoined them to have recourse to the Emperor or for these miraculous cures. The story may be seen in that fine historian where every circumstance seems to add weight to the testimony, and might be displayed at large with all the force of argument and eloquence if any one were now concerned to enforce the evidence of that exploded and idolatrous superstition. The gravity, solidity, age, and probity of so great an emperor, who thought the whole course of his life conversed in a familiar manner with his friends and courtiers, and never affected those extraordinary airs of divinity assumed by Alexander and Demetrius, the historian, a contemporary writer noted for candor and veracity, and withal the greatest and most penetrating genius, perhaps, of all antiquity, and so free from any tendency to credulity that he even lies under the contrary imputation of atheism and profaneness. The persons from whose authority he related the miracle of established character for judgment and veracity, as we may well presume eye-witnesses of the fact and confirming their testimony after the Flavian family was despoiled of the empire, and could no longer give any reward as the price of a lie. Utrum qua qui interfuir, nuc quo qui memorant, post quam nullum mendacio pretium. To which, if we add the public nature of the facts as related, it will appear that no evidence can well be supposed stronger for so gross and so palpable a falsehood. These extracts will give some idea of the grace and power and penetration of Hume. The society he kept the abilities with which he was justly credited, the reputation his works deservedly won for him, made him a man of mark and influence in his day. Read by the learned, courted by statesmen, he taught gentlemen liberality and government's toleration. The influence of Hume, silent and inappreciable to the multitude, has been of the utmost importance to the nation. His works have been studied by philosophers, politicians, and prelates. The writings of no freethinker except Voltaire have maintained their ground with continually increasing reputation. Oddly enough, none of Hume's works were popular when they first appeared. In fact, his treatise on human nature he had to reprint in the form of essays five years after its first publication. It, then, for the first time, began to be bought, but not to any great extent. Five years later he again made it reappear under the form of an inquiry concerning the human understanding. It was not until this third publication that he began to perceive symptoms of its coming into notice. The world has since made up for its negligence by perpetual comment and solid appreciation. A king among thinkers, the clergy have in the provinces of politics and philosophical speculation to acknowledge allegiance to him, 
however they may rebel against his theological heresies. End of David Hume by John Watts